Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Golf in Business Seminars presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. Today, uh, I usually moderate the uh, Catalyst webinar series where I introduce the presenter and, and welcome everybody to the webcast. Uh, today, as part of the quarterly Golf in Business Seminars, uh, I am the presenter today on driving food and beverage dollars per round uh, in every uh, in every venue, uh, public and private, we're going to try to cover it all. Um, Seiko Matsumura was well, wonderful enough to do the first three golf and business seminars in quarter one. And we are halfway through the second quarter of golf and business seminars uh, with Eric Lohman presenting on driving T-sheet revenue in a post-COVID era last month. And uh, yours truly doing driving uh, food and beverage dollars per round uh, this month. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the webcast this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, as I said, the theme is today driving f and dollars per round, public and private. Goals for today. I uh, just kind of segue before we get into uh, the goals for today. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to kind of tell my story on uh, driving f and dollars per round at the public and private level. Uh, we're going to go through the PowerPoint. I've got some pictures uh, that could uh, hopefully encourage some discussion and some questions towards the end of the webcast. So I encourage all of you to uh, raise your hand or uh, when I get closer to the end of the presentation, I'll enable everybody to, uh, uh, to unmute themselves and speak and interject. Um, there's really nothing off limits when it comes to uh, driving F&B dollars per round, um, but uh, away we go. Goals for today, we're gonna try to pick up some tips to drive more revenue. Um, we're going to try to build a better service product for your clientele. We're going to grab tools to build a solid F&B product at various types of clubs with different employees. Why? The question comes up in the desert all the time. Why when it comes to food and beverage dollars per round? The uh, Most of the member dining at most private clubs, and I want to say almost all private clubs in the Coachella Valley and in private clubs across the board uh, are an expense. They're an amenity. They don't, they don't make money at all. They actually expense money. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a cost. It's a burden on the business. When I first started at Monterey, uh, coming from eight years on the, on the public side and um, being on the public side, if, if your food and beverage operation or your food and beverage venue didn't make money at the bottom line, you didn't do it. There was no reason to do it, or there was no mentality wrapped around it uh, to do it if it, if, it, if, it, if it costs money. So getting out to the desert in 2016, uh, seeing that our uh, F&B controllable EBITDA was budgeted every year at uh, anywhere from minus 90,000 to minus 150K, it was like, hey, wait a minute, it costs us $150,000 to offer food and beverage uh, in a given year, why we'd be better off closing the doors. But at a country club, you can't do that because you're not a country club anymore. You're a golf course. And so much more of the guest experience and the emphasis on value uh, comes from food and beverage outlets and the experience that the club can create for their clientele, for their membership, for their public uh, with food and beverage really makes or breaks the experience. You know, it's, it's, it's up there with, with course conditions and pace of play. So, um, you know, I made some mistakes in that first couple of years at, at Monterey where, you know, I was, I was really hell bent on trying to get the food and beverage operation to a, a zero number. And um, when I should have been focused on driving member trust and, uh, in the effort to try to get to zero from this minus 100, minus 150K controllable EBITDA number, uh, I, I, cost some, I cost some member trust in that time because, you know, case in point, you know, if you, you've got a, a, a small plates night that you do for your membership, especially at Monterey, we have a, a, an older membership. So the, the, the price points of the dishes are significant and they need to be a certain way. So if you're charging anywhere from, you know, Chili's prices, you know, $12 to $19 a plate, and you're going to have 50 to 75 members come to that event. Well, you do the math on that. And if you're trying to hit a, a, a reasonable 
labor percentage number like you would if you were a standalone restaurant, well, you should be able to offer that uh, that service product with one bartender, one server, one busser, two cooks, and a dishwasher. But you try to do a member event for 70 people with that amount of, uh, of, of labor support, it's going to be a bloodbath. I mean, literally a bloodbath. Um, so uh, you, you have to be able to create the service that the membership expects. And at the same time, there's a ceiling on what you can charge for that because you're going to get to a point where the, the, the membership of the clientele is not going to see the value in paying uh, what you need to charge to make it profitable. And at the end of the day, you should be more focused on driving revenue in other areas and, and, and holding on to the idea that that food and beverage dollars per round, it's, it's so much a part of the amenity of the experience, even very much on the, on, the, on the public level. So why do we do this? We drive food and beverage dollars per round, not only from a revenue standpoint, but an amenity and experience standpoint. The F&B experience is a reflection on how well the club is run and how much the service team cares. A lot of times, you know, when it comes to course conditions or pace of play, it's easy for the clientele uh, or, you know, range conditions, parking lot conditions, uh, restroom facilities conditions. When there's no personal touch associated with it, it's easy for the, the membership or the clientele to miss uh, the the care and attention that the staff puts into that product. But when you have a person uh, and a, uh, a tangible item like a food or a beverage that goes uh, that goes out to the the clientele, it, it's really apparent uh, how well the uh, the facility is focused on the guest experience because there's a human touch associated with it. Uh, also, it's a it's a perception issue. Um, you know, just going back to my story about Monterey, it's like okay, we lose one hundred fifty thousand dollars on food and beverage every year. Uh, let's let's spend a year with the with the food and beverage doors closed. And uh, we're going to right there right off the bat, we're going to be 150 K better than we were the year before. Well, you're going to lose all your members because uh, it, it, again, if it's not uh, a country club is so much more than just a golf course experience. So, um, and it's, a, it's, it's funny to say this, but it took me two years to get my head wrapped around that. All right. First and foremost, you can't do it all alone. Just like uh, Justin Rose says on the uh, 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 Charles Schwab. Uh, I digress. Um, you can't do it all alone. You have to have a good staff around you and you have to have the right staff. So, so tough, especially in this day and age, not to harp on um, changing cultures and millennials and, and uh, time marching on. Um, staffing is tremendously important because of course you can't be in every outlet at every moment of the day. You've got to have the right team around you. So how do you get the right team? Well, you get the right team by hiring the right people, right? Easy enough. Well, there's a couple things that you can do to make sure, or not make sure, but give you better odds, better chances of making, bringing in the right uh, teammates to support your operation. You want teammates that love to make people happy. This is a service industry. You know, you're serving golf, you're serving food, you're serving beverage, you're serving an experience, you're serving a time pass. Uh, you've got to have people that enjoy making people happy because that intangible asset that employees have allows them to navigate through situations that are really because of the diversity of people and, and the ever-changing um, uh, minutia of situations. You can't train employees how to accomplish good quality member and customer service in all the millions of scenarios that can happen. But if you are hiring people that have the right intentions and truly enjoy making people happy and enjoy the service industry and are people people, those employees, those teammates are going to be better chanced to navigate their way through a sticky situation or through any situation because their end goal is to make people happy, uh, especially in food and beverage where it's not necessarily about that penny at the bottom line. It's about the member experience. So if it means giving half price off on a beer or, or, or giving a free beer because the, the previous one was warm or flat or the burger took too long to come out, the free product is not so detrimental to the operation. It's the member experience that's pinnacle to the whole thing. So if you're, if you're looking for teammates, uh, and it's not just food and beverage. I mean, this, you need this in golf. You need this in tennis. You need this in fitness. You need this in, in membership and sales. You need this in accounting. 
if you have a private club with an accounting office, your accounting department needs to have a uh, a desire to make people happy. Otherwise, you're going to lose member trust because you're going to be making everybody mad um, because you've got a a a, 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 a prickly uh, accounting department that m members and, and guests don't like to to work with and deal with. Uh, but if you've got if you're looking for people that have that servant's heart, and I quote Jim Hinckley, you know he 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 uh, he's the uh, Century Golf partner and uh, worked with American Golf for a number of years. Uh, he talked about uh, we're looking for people with servants' hearts because that allows you to navigate through just about any situation if you're looking to make people happy and that's your end goal. Because if you're looking for people that don't enjoy making people happy and people that are just looking for an assembly line, tell me what to do, give me A, give me B, give me C, and I'll do it, that's only going to work with a, a small percentage of the customer service interactions and that person ultimately is going to be set up to fail and they themselves are not going to be happy in the job because again they don't their their number one goal is not not to make people happy so what, when we hire people especially for food and beverage at monterey when we hire uh, uh food and beverage service employees we ask you know after we get to know them we'll go through the, all the ruder, rudimentary uh steps of, you know, of your basic interview we get to a point where we ask, why us? Why are you seeking out Monterey? What are the, give us the three biggest reasons why you want to join this team. And if they don't say somewhere in those three, uh, those three reasons or those three explanations, if they don't say that they enjoy making, making people happy, we don't hire them. It doesn't matter who they know or who referred them. They've got to be able to have that. Cause you know, if they say money, and we go over to the other side of the slide here where if they say they need a job or their money is their number one goal, that's not who we're looking for. Because, you know, studies show time and time again that uh, money is not even one of the top two or three reasons why people um, are, end up being long term employees in, in different jobs. The money is not in the top two or three reasons why, they're the, why they've been at a certain place for 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's a love for what they do and in the uh, food and beverage service industry the love for what you do really has to be rooted in making people happy so another uh, uh pratfall to stay away from when you're looking for teammates uh, to build your team when you're uh, covering past employment uh, if you see a lot of blame or uh, accusations or otherwise uh, poor speaking about a past employer usually it's a red flag for a teammate you want to stay away from Looks like that person typically uh, is not taking ownership for past wrongdoings. And, and if they're not going to own past wrongdoings in a previous job, odds are when, uh, when they stumble an error, which all people do in, in jobs, they're, they're, they're going to be likely not to own that error. And if they don't own that error, uh, they don't learn from it. And they don't, you know, we, I'm saying they, we, I'm in the same boat. Uh, we're likely to make that error again if we don't own it. And, uh, and look for an opportunity to grow from it. All right, now we got our team. We've gone through our hiring process. We've built a team of, of people that enjoy making people happy. Now it's time to train the service element and then we'll get into placement and product and timing and all that. Uh, Cause there's a lot of things that, that um, there's geez, a lot of things covered. We could talk for like three hours on this uh, topic. Uh, you need a unified catchphrase, if you will, team goal, a, uh, a slogan that ties every single department together uh, in food and beverage. Uh, for at Monterey, our number one goal is to build member trust in everything that we do. That phrase applies to everybody on our team, to greenskeepers, to janitors, to tennis pros, to golf pros, to cooks, to bussers, to bartenders, to servers, to accounting people, to myself. Our number one goal is to build member trust in everything we do, because the more member trust we have, the easier it is for us to drive our business. And especially in driving F&B dollars per round, we need their trust. If we don't have the customer's trust or the member's trust, they're gonna be really hesitant to give us their dollars for that food and beverage experience. So we need a training process and a manual so often that uh, food and beverage employees are hired and on their first day, two people call out and they're supposed to do nothing more than shadow uh, a, a given team lead on that day. And there's a couple of call outs and before you know it, it's trial by fire and that employee is thrown into a situation where they're ultimately set up to fail. You need to have a training manual, you need to have structure, but 
as we all know, 99% of your F&B frontline employees that you hire, if you give them a training manual that's got 100 pages in it, it's going to go in the backseat of their car on the day they get hired, it's going to stay in the backseat of their car for a couple of weeks, and then it's going to get moved to the house where it's going to stay in the house in a given location where it's going to collect dust. And then six months later, it's going to make its way to the trash. So the training manual is there from the impression of, hey, we have a training manual. We take this serious. We have structure. Here you go on the first day. But, uh, you know, a lot of training manuals, they could be blank after that first page and it would have the same impact on the teammate. The most important thing is that you have a consistent standardized training process where uh, there is a team lead, there is a shift lead, there is a process by which each teammate, when they come in, is trained in a systematic manner. This is good for the employee. It's also good for the establishment because if you've got a standardized training process, it's easy. It's easier to identify standout uh, A players and stars because they will excel in that training process. And you'll also uh, be able to identify people that are perhaps not fit for that position or, or not the right hire or, or, or what have you. Um, that trial by fire thing happens, you know, really more times than not. And it's almost the norm in so many situations. And, and we're guilty of it as well from time to time at, at, at Monterey. Um, but it just comes down to being able to provide your teammates with the appropriate and adequate amount of resources for success. Uh, the contingency reviews. Uh, these are the situations where, you know, a lot of times it's, it's, it's difficult to go into an interview process with food and beverage employees where you throw situations at them because you end up making them nervous and they search for the right answer. They search for what you think you want to hear and you don't get an accurate um, uh, perception of, of, of how they would really be in that situation um, when the time comes. But after the training process has already started, that is where you can visit uh, situations that now the, the trainee or the new employee has an idea of what you're talking about because they've gone through some training and they've seen a situation, they can extrapolate on it a little better and you can better help train them in the process. So repeat, repeat, repeat. Training is not, uh, you know, it's not anything that happens for two weeks or one week or 30 days. It really goes on forever. And again, if you're hiring the right people that enjoy making people happy, that's really the theme of, of, of our whole hiring structure. Um, those people are always looking to get better. There's a selfless nature to them, as we all know, where, you know, in just about every walk of, of, of business and life, we're better the more selfless we are, we're worse the more selfish we are. Um, we want to be able to celebrate the successes. We want to be able to review the failures. And um, it's always good to have an incentive program. Incentive program ignites that human competitive nature that we all have. Uh, and, it, and it, it's easier to get people to buy in when there's a little incentive. Now, of course, money's not the number one motivator in that incentive. It's nice to get a little spiff on what they sell and what they drive. But again, when you ask them at the end of a specific incentive program, what they really enjoyed about it was money is almost always the second thing. The first thing is being, you know, getting the recognition and being good at something and being uh, measured at something uh, in a positive way versus your peers. All right, selling tools. We're seeing so much of this out in the world uh, in different retail operations and food and beverage operations. Yes, you have to have a script because you can't leave it up to the teammate, the new food and beverage employee, the bartender, the server, um, the snack bar attendant, the beverage cart attendant, the uh, in the COVID era, the takeout um, delivery answering front desk service that takes the calls for the for the takeout orders. You do have to have a script. You can't leave it up to them to develop their own selling tool. This is your operation and you have a better idea for what's going to drive food and beverage revenue better than anybody you should on that team. So you do need a script. However, that script cannot sound like a script when the when the teammate is uh, speaking it to the member or the customer. Uh, so often you see it where you're, you're not to pick on any restaurants out there in the world, but you just sit down and they come up and they ask you if you want to try the special or if they, you want to, you, if you're interested in the dessert and the, the script is so insincere and uh, it, it takes me back. Like Robin Shelton is one of my mentors and um, he's real big on the, the essence of selling. What is the essence of selling? You're solving someone's need, problem, or want. And when the employee 
uh, and or the the server just retorts this canned script. Are you interested in the the pizuki today, or 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 the drink special, or whatever it is? If it doesn't sound like they're genuinely interested in solving my problem, or genuinely interested in making for a better experience, uh, a, a better experience for me. I'm I'm quick to identify that. I'm quick to see that they don't they're not they don't really want to solve my problem. They're just saying this because they have to. You see it at gas stations all the time too, where they have to tell you about something that's on the counter, and there's just no no sincerity about it. So I true I don't think they're trying to help me or solve my problem or tell me that it's important for me to know about this thing. But when that script is practiced and it's emphatically built into the delivery that the teammate has with the with the client or the member it looks and feels so much more like hey they're trying to help me out they're trying to make sure that i don't go out there without a beer or they're trying to make sure i don't go out there on a hot day without a gatorade or i don't go out there without my my hot dog coupon you know they, they're trying to help me have a better experience and when uh, uh, uh something we used to do um at, at la mirada and shoal canyon is at the in the golf shop you sell a lot a beverage you know you've got gatorades in there you got waters you got beer um at both clubs before uh, we started there, uh, the cooler was in some sort of uh, position in the shop away from the counter. We set it up so that the cooler was positioned not only at the counter, but in a way uh, conducive to when the employee swipes the credit card with their right hand, because for us at both places, the credit card terminal was on the right side the employee's right side of the monitor. So when they take the card, they'd slide that on the right side of the monitor. We made sure that the cooler was to the right of where that hand motion was because it lended to the script that we practiced to where it was, it was, it was, an, it, it, was it was conveyed as an afterthought to the employee to say, oh, right before I swipe your credit card for your green fees, oh, um, you want a uh, tall can? We've got two for five bucks or Gatorade. There's also water in there as well. Todd out there. And it was this, oh, wow, that employee remembered, you know, he was, it, it came off so much more as a concern for the guest experience, making sure that you're not going out there without the right liquids that are, that are going to make for a better experience for you. And it didn't work. When we first did it, it was like, okay, my first knee-jerk reaction was, okay, well, that cooler can't be over there. It needs to be closer to the counter so we could we could go after that impulse buy. But we had it on the left, and it was just not easy for the employee, myself included, to, before I swiped the credit card on the right-hand side, it wasn't easy for me to cross over, or it was inconvenient for me to cross over and talk about what's in the cooler. It was so much easier when it was on that side, and it looked like uh, it, it was, it just came across so much better. Uh, emphasis on the body language. Uh, it really helps to break down the script in the script. Uh, and another thing that was a big part of the success on driving the food and beverage dollars per round, particularly in Shoal Canyon, was uh, I covered the majority of the shifts on the counter. So it, I was so much more bought into the, I, you know, I walk the walk. You know, this is how we do it. And I was, I was, you know, even, you know, I, I wasn't spiffing myself on the incentive program. I was in the competition because, again, I was motivated by the spiff on the, on the sale. I was motivated by being best at it. So I could, you know, I could create the, the, the team unity of being able to walk the walk. It's like, well, John walks the walk. We could all walk the walk. And this is, he's doing, he's not asking me to do anything he doesn't do himself. And he does it damn good. So I want to do it well. And, you know, it makes it fun. All right, driving the revenue every day. Time check. I have, uh, those of you that know me, I have a tendency to, to run over a little bit. I got a lot of slides. I put all the pictures at the end so that when I'm done with the slideshow, we can fly, fly through the pictures. I could pay attention to the, uh, uh, the hands raised and the, the, the question box, if you will. We can try and get some more, get a little interaction here from, uh, from the attendees. All right, driving the revenue every day. Promote your F&B operation through member and guest interactions with the golf shop staff. That's their forte. It's very difficult, especially in terms of not so much a beverage cart, but particularly in the snack bar, uh, most scenarios, it's, it's more difficult for a snack bar or a halfway house employee to verbalize and sell the goods and the, the, the beverages and the foods that come out of there. 
um, very difficult for them to do. You know, they're good at preparing the food. They're good at, you know, staying on top of stocking and, and owning the job. They do, if you've got the right people with, that enjoy making people happy, um, those people are very good at what they do, but verbally selling uh, what's going on in there, typically not their forte. However, your golf shop staff, those are your chatty people. Those are your people that relate more to the clientele. And when you start the, the day off, the interaction off, and it it's, it's goes for public and it goes for private because both at the public and private level, uh, it all starts with checking into the golf shop. Well, at least it should. In Monterey, well, that's a big thing with us. We need to get more people to check in. Uh, but it starts with that check-in process, both at the private and the public level, where they're checking in, they're getting their scorecard, they're getting their towel, they're getting their pencil, they're finding out who they're after, uh, they're paying their money in the case of a public course uh, or a daily fee. Um, that's the opportunity for the golf shop staff to lay the stage for the food and beverage uh, uh, amenities and uh, goods and services that are available and how, again, they're going to make for a better experience for the, uh, for the player. They're going to solve the player's need, problem, or want. And um, that's also the opportunity for the golf shop staff to create the value in such a, in such a share. Uh, it could be, you know, a million, you could do a million things here. We're not going to spend any much time on that, but, you know, buy one, get one freeze time-based uh, specials, bounce back deals, sky's the limit. But the golf shop and the first impression for the check-in, that's the opportunity to get that information across because putting that on the, the teammates that are in the snack bar preparing the food, more times than not, it's, it's, it's not their forte and you know, they don't have time to, to, to get into all that. You know, they're much better suited to say, yeah, burger coming right up, 550, tall can of beer, you got it, you got your coupon, perfect, here you go. Um, you need social media, you need email specials, you need physical collateral and signs around the club. Those are automatic and those are a must, but that's not what makes the difference at the end of the day. At the end of the day, when driving food and beverage dollars come down to it, it's how the live interactions come from the teammates that are there, both in the golf operation and in the food and beverage operation. Consistency starts with you, the manager, the leader. If it isn't important to you, it's not going to be important to the team. Routine-based behavior on selling our F&B services, very, very important. We want to be consistent. Any of us can have a great day or a great moment with one customer. It's being able to drive it home with the team and with yourself that uh, it's being able to do it day in, day out, member to member, uh, uh, guest to guest. Plan the head, you know, as the manager driving F&B dollars per round, you got to plan ahead. You got to plan the day from that morning. You got to plan the week from the, from the Monday, and you got to plan the month from the first, and you got to plan the year from October for the following year. Um, it's, you know, you, you, you can't quarterback from the other side of the line of scrimmage. It's got to be from your side. Um, one of the ways that, uh, that we do this, particularly in food and beverage, is we have a prospectus. A lot of people are like, what's a prospectus? Prospectus, we, it's called a prospectus at Monterey. I don't even know how we, why it's called a prospectus. Um, but what it is basically is it's a one sheet of paper. It's a Word document. It's got the club logo on it. And very plainly and simply, it's got a day by day. It's a calendar, basically. That's not a calendar. It's a list. And so it gets, it gets updated twice a week by, uh, by yours truly. Um, and sent out to the department heads. It also gets printed out twice a week by yours truly. And you know, I throw a couple copies behind the bar, throw a couple copies in the kitchen, throw a couple copies in the snack bar, throw a couple copies in the golf shop, in the cart barn, so that everybody has a tangible what's going on this week, what's going on today, what's going on tomorrow, what's going on next week, what's going on all the way through the month. And basically, whatever you could go as deep as whatever will fit on one sheet of paper. And it just gets, it's, uh, it's another resource for the team to buy into thinking ahead because proactive is always going to trump reactive. Now we also set goals. You know, the, the, so much about what we do has to be quantifiable and measurable. It's another thing I got from uh, my mentor, Robin Shelton, where it's easy to talk about what we're going to do and what we should do and to set these goals. But if they're not quantifiable and measurable, and we're not going back and, and, and quantifying them and measuring them, we're not really going to get anywhere. 
You know, we're not going to see that we accomplished anything. We're not going to be able to set higher goals. We're not going to get better. It has to be quantifiable and measurable. Otherwise, it's just conversation. It really is. So for us in, in food and beverage uh, dollars per round, we set goals in private events. Uh, and we did this even before uh, uh, before Monterey at La Mirada and, and, and Shoal Canyon. We set goals in private events. So if we've got a quinceanera that's got 150 people and they're paying $39.99 a plate, that's a, a higher price point than a lot of our other quinceaneras. So we will, and a, high, and a higher uh, uh, guest count as well, 150 versus 100. So we're going to set a higher goal for the bar that night. and we're going to we're going to again quantifiably and measurably as we go through by hour by hour and a half or however time permits measure where we are on the sales because we're getting the whole team to buy into that goal that we preset uh, ourselves to get to um we do that you could do this in private events you do this on the public side and the private side we do this in all of our member events because if we know it's a a small plate night and we're on, we've only got 50 reservations well the the bar goal that night or the dessert goal that night is going to be set lower than it would be that, like, hey, gang, we've got 100 people coming tonight. Um, chef's got a $7 dessert on there when they're usually five bucks or whatever it is. You're going to set those goals. You're going to lay out that quantifiable and measurable expectation, and you're going to visit it with the team. And it just lends to getting people to buy into the process. And then you tie a little incentive program into that. Now we're cooking. And not just tonight. We got to do this Thursday. We got to do this next Tuesday. We got to do it the Thursday after. You got to do it over and over and over again. Otherwise, it doesn't get any continuity. The staff uh, doesn't get any better at it. The members don't benefit from the uh, the interactions increasing on that driving on that driving basis. It has to be. It, there's got to be some continuity to it. Okay, we are at nine thirty four. Um, I got a bunch of pictures now that I'd like to talk about. And I would like to, and again, I'm usually the moderator. I'm not usually the presenter. I want to be able to see who's all in here. And for whatever reason, I can't um, the way this is set up now. Ooh. So um, fortunately, I only see Tom and Nikki. Uh, Nikki. John, if you click, um, if you click uh, attendees, we, we'll probably list it as panelists. Just to the right of that shows attendees eleven. If you'd like, I can read them off to you. Or uh, well, no, I guess if you could just you're uh, you're a panelist as well, and <laughs> it's on the Zoom guy, and I, I I'm having difficulty on Zoom. <laughs> uh, forgive me. But if you could just enable them to unmute themselves if they wish, uh, I don't know if they're already set up to do that. When I'm moderating, I'll go down and just click on everybody and give them the ability to uh, to unmute. Oh, there you go. David McGuffin's on here. He's our first assistant professional at Monterey. Okay, everyone should okay. be all set. Anyway, so everybody's, everybody's able to, to jump in there uh, as they go through. But I got some photos here from... Uh, some some clubs and some uh, public and private facilities around just to highlight uh, some great things about these photos. Um, this first one here, this is a members lounge, uh, recently renovated at uh, at a country club, and you know you got to have the the basics. Uh, it's got to be appealing. It's got to be comfortable. It's got to, uh, in terms of a 19th hole or a members lounge, um, you want people coming in there. Not only do you want people coming in there, you want them staying in there. So it's got to be clean. It's got to be appealing. It's got to be current. It's got to have things that are of interest. You know, you got to make sure you have the booze that your membership likes. Uh, it doesn't do any good. Um, like if, if you're if you're at a, at a private club in Austin, Texas, uh, you better carry Tito's. Um, if you don't carry, I mean, Tito's comes from Austin, Texas. So you need to have the you have to you have to have the resources for success. So this re, this bar was recently renovated. It's got three flat screen TVs. It's got um, uh, six beers on tap there, uh, full bar, and uh, looking pretty good. Oh, someone's got her hand up. Thank you, Michael Ganey. Jeff Johnson, come on, the cost of sales average you might expect at a private facility. Okay. Great question. I got a question here from Jeff Johnson. 
Uh, comment regarding cost of sales averages you might expect at a private facility versus public. Now, um, always the cost of sales expectation at a public is going to be lower than cost of sales at a private club. Reason why? Private club member is paying dues. The club should be making the bulk of its money off of dues, 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 dues. Everything else is an amenity or an expense that supports the experience that is delivered by the dues paying member. So, and, and you know, members wanna feel like they go to their club. They don't wanna pay 14 or $16 for a drink like they would at a restaurant. Um, they want, you know, they want that personal touch of knowing that, you know, at my club, of course, cause I pay dues, but at my club, I only have to pay this for drinks and it makes it special. It makes it, uh, it, makes it more of a club. So of course that's gonna swell the cost of goods um, to be much higher. And again, you can have at a public golf course, you could have one bartender and one server serving a room or a lounge like this full of 40 people. And you might be able to get away with it without damaging the, the guest experience too much. You do that at a private club, you're going to get killed. You got to make sure you've got a server for every three tables. So if you got 50 people in there that are drinking in a happy hour, for us at Monterey, we need to have, uh, hopefully uh, my supervisor is not on this, on this webcast, we need to have seven or eight employees to serve those 50 to 60 people. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to keep up with the service expectation that our membership has. Uh, and again, because they pay dues, we, this is an amenity. This is an expense for us, but we know that. We're not in it to drive sales. We're in it to create a wonderful experience for the membership. So public uh, cost of sales on, on beverages you know, really sh should be in the neighborhood of, of, of 20 to, to 29% on beverage and 25 to 32% on food on the uh, private, depending on who you are and where you are and how much your members pay in dues. Um, beverage should be, you know, 27 to 37 and food should be really 30 to, to, to 40, even though in, ma in many cases it's, it's much higher but you didn't hear that from me. Uh, are the quarterly minimums at uh, determinant of any club or equity club members? De determined, minimums of determined. Well, they that's, can't, that's, yes. Detriment, poor typing. Oh, sorry, thank you, Jeff, thank you. Uh, there's, there's a couple different ways to, in, and really food and beverage quarterly minimums in my experience, depend on the the level of the country club the the more entry level the country club the more uh the membership is not qualified by a, a hefty initiation deposit quarterly food and beverage minimums are a deterrent initially on paper they look like they're a great idea because hey we make every member pay a hundred dollars every or two hundred dollars every quarter on food and beverage whether they're here or not well, places that thrive on a low initiation deposit that have a quarterly uh, uh, minimum, uh, first of all, they're a, t a deterrent from enrolling the member because prices is, is they're very price conscious. Another thing is the operation itself, and a lot of people don't know this, and I've seen this firsthand with one of our neighbors uh, at Monterey. Um, what happens is, there's a quarterly food and beverage minimum that the membership detests. And what happens is the vast majority of the membership doesn't patronize the food and beverage operation until that last week of the quarter. Right. And then the club gets blitzkrieg by all this traffic. Traffic. It's hard for them to keep up with service. What happens is the people that are coming by to get there to spend their money don't get the service that they appreciate. Um, they don't get the product they appreciate. It fuels them to do nothing more than what they continue to do is wait for the last week of the quarter, go wait in line for your 45 minute burger and, you know, you know, spend, uh, spend your $200, um, and just get it done with poor service and a poor experience. Furthermore, the percentage of the membership that are your regulars that do support the food and beverage day in and day out, they know that last two weeks of the quarter, they're going to get put on the back burner. They're going to want to stay away because they know that the quality of the goods and services are going to suffer during that time. And really, um, 
food and beverage controllable EBITDA is not writing any checks for any club. It's an amenity that supports the dues paying experience. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, we've got another one here. How, how dramatic is the difference between F and B revenue per player per round at the public or versus private? Well, I mean, it's dramatic. I mean, especially the more busy the golf course is uh, on the public side, the harder it is to move that food and beverage dollars per round. And of course it's, it's, it's going to be much higher at the private level because there's more support uh, typically from the members and there's a fraction as many rounds played. So it's like you, you, you see it in, in, uh, in our portfolio where the average uh, food and beverage dollars per round on the public side was, you know, nine to 15 uh, and well, five to $15 per round where the average on the public side was like 60 cents to $3, you know, uh, per round. So that's, um, uh, the long and the short of that. This is that same bar. And I uh, wanted to show this pic. Oh, I've got another question here. Banquet Pardon business me. is- I'm, I'm gonna stop any second now. That's okay, Jim. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Um, we got plenty of time. Is banquet business the driver of your F&B operation? Yes. Uh, without banquet business that, you know, I talk about Monterey and, and many clubs in the desert having a uh, controllable EBITDA. Uh, it, for those of you that don't know, controllable EBITDA, uh, EBITDA is earnings before tax, interest, and depreciation. Um, and uh, anyway, earnings before tax and depreciation and, and amortization. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the uh, if, if for many clubs in the desert, many clubs, private clubs everywhere, uh, the controllable EBITDA in food and beverage is uh, is a red number. In many cases, a giant red number. Banquet business offsets that negative number because banquet business we aren't. If we if we were just a banquet hall and we only did weddings and private partings and, and quinceañeras, we would actually make money on our bottom line because the uh, the clientele is paying for so much more than the cost of the food. Where you could charge 60 bucks for a chicken plate uh, with rice pilaf and, and, and seasonal vegetables on there, you could charge 59.99 plus plus for a, uh, a wedding event because it comes with the room, it comes with the setup, it comes with the venue. Uh, you can't charge your members $60 for a chicken plate, you'll get hung. You know, that, that same chicken plate, your members wouldn't pay more than 14 bucks for. Uh, so yes, uh, private parties uh, do help offset that, and if we, and 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 the dynamic is, the more upscale the club, the less opportunity there is to have private events. But again, the less emphasis there is on that controllable EBITDA number. You know, many clubs need to sell private events as much as they as much as they per, they can, uh, permitting the agreement with the membership or however it is. For us at Monterey, we can sell every single Saturday night. Uh, we can sell every single Sunday night. We can sell every single Friday night. Um, uh, and that, again, helps us offset our overall profitability, which, you know, the selling point to the membership is the more you are supportive of us having private events on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sunday nights, the lower your, you know, your costs are going to be on food and beverage items and the lower your dues are going to be because we're making this ancillary income that's allowing us to keep our dues low. But other clubs, you know, very high end clubs where you can only have a private event there on a Saturday night that's sponsored by a member and they can only have, you know, eight or nine a year. Well, that's a different that's a different matzo ball altogether because the emphasis isn't on offsetting the dues. You know, um, it's a it's a, it's about the, the quality of the product and the exclusivity of the membership. Okay, um, how do you measure the value of on-course snack bar and or course refreshment vehicles, especially in today's COVID world? How do you measure the value? Well, I mean, I think you do, you, it's, it's tough. So many times when it comes to, to measuring, being quantify, quantifiable and measurable results, it's difficult to go back to last year. It, it, historically, we would always go back to the prior year. How do you make next year's budget? You look at the current year, you look at the current year, you look at where you're going, you look at renovations that you have, you look at of where your focus is going to be for your business model in the future. Very difficult right now because the lab, we're coming off of basically two years of unprecedented behavior. But I think you measure, um, you measure 
the 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 value of it based on um the burden the expense puts on your business versus the feedback you get from the clientele on on how special it is and i i i not to not to compare la county properties but a lot of la property uh, la county properties that uh that my company operates when there's more food and beverage service the club is viewed better by the public even though that food and beverage operation may not be contributing much to that bottom line versus another club that's not offering any of that the 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 club is viewed better by the public and it's it's got better ratings online because it's got that human touch it's got that human experience and it's got that uh emphasis on service that the uh the other place that may not have any of those things going has the same you know maybe even better amount of bottom line profitability but again not as good a customer uh, service um, index, which again, drives rounds. Oh, I went back to this picture because this is the outside picture of the, uh, the, the newly renovated bar on the inside. And it really, uh, it has a little something for everybody in terms of we wanna sit outside, we wanna sit inside in a COVID era. Uh, people are, are, are gonna be conscious about masks and indoors and other people in, uh, in inhaling and exhaling that's going to be going on for a long time I mean maybe forever so to be able to have your some diversity and some versatility in your operation in terms of being able to serve people inside and outside so that they can be comfortable because why the more comfortable they are the more they're likely to patronize the more they're likely to stay I just lost a question there. Beverage car operations and related inventory control. Not specific, I know, but can be a controversy. Well, hey, I, I wonder, Jeff, are you asked, talking about the, the beverage card employee that buys their own uh, beer and liquor outside brings it in sells it so and pockets the profit and doesn't touch the inventory that the club has because yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that happens and it, you know it just needs to be again uh, the, the the manager's got to be engaged the manager's got to be plugged in and it goes back to hiring the right people uh that are there for the right reasons but uh you know that uh that definitely happens more than uh we'd all like it to there's no doubt about it yeah S sadly there there is that that i I've, I've heard of um at one time or another and um i i just think that the checking in stocking the beverage car and having someone uh verify the unstocking of the beverage car is is always um a, a bit of Gosh, it, it, it's a bit of a chore. And it is. Right it is. And again, when you've got the right people and then you could skip over that, uh, it uh, it makes life easier on everybody because more than likely, uh, the if you do have someone that re requires their cart to be checked before and after, odds are that's not the best teammates you want in that position mm -hmm. to begin with. Because um, you know, another mentor of mine, Brian Boda. When he taught me, when you have a red flag in one area, there's a very good chance that there's red flags in many other areas. Yeah, well said. Ooh, I can't get to where I'm going. Uh, another thing I'd like to talk about with the beverage cart, it's important to keep the beverage cart, uh, and this one goes out to you, McGuffin. Uh, it's important to keep the beverage cart far away from the clubhouse unless they're coming in to restock that beverage cart should be nowhere around the snack bar the halfway house or the 19th hole um uh, and another thing that speaks to the the value of the service that goes into food and beverage uh, driving food and beverage dollars per round in terms of the beverage cart is everybody's got to be on board with that process uh, walkie-talkie systems with the marshals walkie-talkie systems with the cart staff walkie-talkie system with the beverage card attendant themselves so that the interactions and the inquiries uh, and the needs, again, uh, solving their need, problem, or want, a group is on six, couldn't be farther away from the clubhouse. Um, the marshal comes across them, beverage card attendants on the other side of the course, 
that communication system will allow the problem, need, or want of that group that's on six through the marshal, through the, the walkie-talkie, to get to the beverage cart attendant so they can get that, that product and service delivered and that problem solved faster. So having everybody buy into that process, but uh, the geography of that beverage cart uh, is is very important because it doesn't do it. Do, it's it's insane to have the beverage cart parked right outside the snack bar, um, and people on the golf course who are not getting those, not experiencing those touch points with food and beverage employees, and having those opportunities to to support when you got both venues right next to each other. Okay, we talked about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move this chat window. Um, hopefully, I can still see questions that are coming in. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, TA. Uh, I think TA asked a question that I missed, um, but clean and appealing. It's got to be clean. It's got to be appealing. Those are the basics. And it's got to have all of the accoutrements that, again, to, to go back to sales, what is sales all about? Solving a person's need, problem, or want. It's got to have all the accoutrements that that membership or that clientele could need, and it's got to be appealing so that um, they come in they want to come in, and then when they come in, they want to stay. Also, we talk about activities. When it comes to driving uh, food and beverage dollars per round, it's, it's the old casino concept. You know, the longer they stay, the longer they are likely to, uh, in, the, in the case of a casino, lose. But uh, in the case of our food and beverage operations, the more and more likely they are to support it and, and, and drive the revenue incrementally. It's important to have things in there Beyond no one, you know, most most members and guests don't want to just sit in an empty room and drink and eat. You know, they want to do these things alongside other things that lend to a better experience. Video games, uh, sporting events, um, lounging activities, popcorn. Going back to uh, uh, driving food and beverage dollars per round, you've got to have the right resources for success. You've got to have a kitchen that's dialed in. This is a, a really well dialed in kitchen. It's uh, um, everything's working in there. The fryers are adequately sized. The hot line works, the cold line works. Um, it doesn't do any good to market this wonderful food and beverage operation and have all these great front of the house food and beverage uh, teammates ready to sell and drive F&B dollars per round when you don't have the back end to support it. Because that's gonna be a one trick pony and you're gonna lose them. Uh, outdoor venue here that, uh, again, goes back to the COVID era, the pre-COVID era, and the post-COVID era, where you've got the ability to serve members in a variety of different settings in one location. You got the, fu the fire pit there on the right. You got the, the four top with the umbrella there in the middle. And you've got couches down the side. And then also you have bistro lighting so that you could do this at night because this is Southern California. Like a, a vast majority of the, of, the, of the year, nighttime is a great time. And, you know, and it was a growing trend. And a lot of, and a lot of people are aware of this, but it was a growing trend even before COVID that um, uh, alfresco dining, outdoor dining was on the rise even before the pandemic hit because dining outside is special. Dining outside is something that a lot of us can't do in our homes, um, and, it, and it lends to that experience. It's also, you know, the, the right, having the right resources for success. Also, you want to be able to uh, service the needs and wants where they need to be. This is a, a, another club here that has a, uh, a very nice uh, patio area outdoor uh, seating area that's associated with the tennis operation. Uh, again, if you don't have it, you can't sell it. And being able to have that opportunity um, and going back to private clubs, food and beverage dollars per round are so important in the private club world because golf doesn't do it on its own anymore. They're, they're in a, I'll, I'll use Monterey as an example. In the, in the 80s, golf, and the golf course would sell it a ninth, a six thousand dollar membership in a year because you know the the husband played golf with his friends uh, th three days a week. The wife would play golf with her friends three days a week. They'd play golf one day with each other, and that would be it. They wouldn't need fitness. They wouldn't need 
wine club. They wouldn't need dining. They wouldn't need pickleball. They wouldn't need tennis. They wouldn't need all these other things that support the value of the membership because golf was able to do it on its own. In this day and age, the, the, the golfers will spend the money just like they did back in the day, but there's got to be the members. There's got to be so much more in that membership than just golf. There's got to be camaraderie that's wrapped around a variety of different things. Wine club, good dining menu, pickleball, fitness, uh, meetup.com, uh, hiking groups. There's got to be uh, a variety of different ways for people to do things with friends because that's really what they're ultimately looking for when they join a country club. They're looking for friendships. They're looking to do things with other people. And it used to be golf was enough. It's not anymore. They want to do things. They want to meet new people. They want to do, they, they, they want to, they want to engage in activity so much more than just golf. You got to have golf. That's the most important thing, but you got to have good dining. You got to have fitness. You got to have pickleball. You got to have community. You got to have communication. You got to have a lot of different ways for people to get together and do different things with these new people they just met. Comfort and casual um, appeals to creatures, uh, appeals to the creatures of habit that we are. Your, uh, your operation needs to be set up in a way that uh, it's easy for people to make a habit out of supporting it, both from a location standpoint at your facility or at your club, but also once in that location, it needs to be comfortable. It needs to lend to uh, the habit of people coming back to it day in, day out. Um, this is just a, 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 a going going back to um, prioritizing driving food and beverage dollars per round. This is a this is a club that um, COVID and and also another uh, 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 situation that came up where they cannot serve inside. This club has a grill and food and beverage operation on the first tee outside under a tent. Now, does that food and beverage operation make money it probably doesn't make much but it upholds the experience of the patron and provides an opportunity to solve their need problem or want of having food and beverage available while they're golfing because um, again it's so much more it's probably from a uh, a pencil a pencil and paper standpoint probably not that essential to have that food and beverage operation there but if you don't have that, it's going to affect the green fees because people are going to be less likely to come when it's only golf that's there. So uh, again, an amenity that supports the green fee or the dues paying experience. This is a wonderful uh, lounge. Um, and, and this is a, at a property where the, uh, I would venture to say the, the F&B dollars per round um, with this, this is a recently renovated lounge that was really just a snack bar historically. The uh, the dollars per round, without without rounds going up or down respectively, the dollars per round went up when this got completed and this amenity was finished. The dollars per round probably went up by forty percent, and it just looks really good and it's a great picture, uh, and I like sharing it. I mean, you've got. Uh, You've got a little bit of everything uh, in there. You've got a million beers on tap. You got a full bar. You got a bunch of different TVs where you could put on something for everybody. Um, it's a great pick. I another thing I love about this pick, and it's got uh, it's got Kershaw there in the middle of his delivery on uh, that top right um, uh, shot. Okay, so that uh, is just about all the time that we have this morning. Um, See if I could hit another couple questions before we wrap up. And I think that's it. Any other questions or comments? Anybody want to unmute themselves? Now's the time to jump in. Otherwise, we're going to say uh, good day to everybody. Um, thank you very much for uh, being on the uh, on the Gibbs this morning. Uh, thank you very much for for joining us. Uh, this is being recorded and we will send out uh, the YouTube link for it and you will be able to access it through, uh, through the SC PGA website um, as well. Uh, no quiz, everybody that uh, joined the uh, live webcast this morning, you'll be able to get one MSR credit for, uh, for the hour this morning. Thank you for allowing me to be of service, everybody. Have a great day. Stay safe. Stay sane out there. We'll see you soon.
hopefully Thank next you. Thursday on the Catalyst webinar, we've got Charlie Davidson of uh, uh, Origin Designs, Todd Eckenrode Origin Designs. They've renovated a bunch of clubs in the Southern California area over the last uh, 20 years, but some really good ones in, uh, in the last four or five. Uh, Charlie's going to be on with slides of uh, all their renovations. Um, excited to have him on. So hopefully we see you next Thursday on the Catalyst. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, John.